I will do the introduction for our first speaker, which is Dr. Mindy, Gold Mindy Goldsboro, who is the Chief Science and Technology Officer and Vice President and General Manager of ACS, which is the Cell Biology Product and Technology Development arm of ATCC. And prior to ATCC, Mindy was Director of R&D for BD Biosciences Advanced Bioprocessing Group. And before that, she held many senior R&D roles at BD, BD Biosciences as well as Life Technologies. Mindy has more than 25 years of product and, and technology development expertise in cell and molecular biology. And for education, Mindy earned a PhD in genetics from George Washington University and completed her dissertation research and postdoctoral work at the NIH on, and at NCI. So with that, Mindy, welcome. Thank you, Mary Ellen, and uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm sure that the vast majority of you are very familiar with ATCC, and when you hear that name, it probably conjures up the idea of a sea of freezers and liquid nitrogen tanks. And that is true. We do have a sea. Actually, we have several seas of freezers and liquid nitrogen tanks. But that's not all that we do. And I'm here today to tell you about a part of ATCC that you may not be familiar with. We have a very active group of R&D scientists who are developing cell-based assays for use by the research community. So within the portfolio of ATCC, we have over 4,000 cell lines. The vast majority of those cell lines have been deposited with ATCC by scientists such as yourselves. And what our R&D scientists are now doing is that they are modernizing that collection because that collection is not now as relevant as it once was to the types of research and activities that our customers are doing. And we are using several technologies such as CRISPR and other uh, technologies to improve that. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to give you some insight into the types of um, cell-based assays that we are developing. So we have a wide variety of in vitro models. I'm going to talk about a couple of these in detail. But one of the hallmarks of all of our models, no matter what types of cells or cell lines that they are, is that they are traceable, authenticated, and highly characterized. So today I'm going to be talking specifically about some models that are useful in drug development and toxicology because I felt that that was the most relevant to the audience that, that has uh, attended today. So in my history, you know, Mary Ellen you know, mentioned that I've been in this business for, for over 25 years. I won't tell you exactly how long I've been in this business, but um, over that time, I've seen really a remarkable evolution in uh, cell-based models. When I started in the lab, there really weren't models. There were just cell lines. If you were in a human, um, you were using HeLa cells. If you were a mouse model, you were using NIH3T3s. And the cells didn't tell you anything. And the assays were very complex because there were no reporter. So then we moved on to the area of transfection. And now your cells could tell you something. So it was great. But a lot of those models were built in easily transfectable cell lines, such as uh, HEK 293s. They weren't necessarily the most physiologically relevant or most predictive models for the area of research that you were working on. But today we have tools such as CRISPR that allow us to make those relevant cell lines. So the scientists at ATCC are very busy using those physiologically relevant cell lines to create hopefully the most predictive models for use in your, in your areas. So the first one I'm going to talk about is an angiogenesis assay. So here we felt that we, had, we could build a better model. Most angiogenesis assays are uh, using primary cells. You're using an undefined matrix. So we had a better idea. Because we have um, a wide variety of immortalized cell lines, we could make a better model by combining two immortalized cell lines. One is an endothelial cell, which we put, which we labeled with GFP, so you can do a live cell assay. And the other was a mesenchymal stem cell, which creates uh, the microenvironment that you need. And you can see um, with that red image up there is uh, 
labeling with anti-smooth muscle actin. So you're actually getting physiologically relevant microenvironment with the vessels as well as um, some muscle. So it's these types of assays that we're bringing to the, to the research community. We're trying to make assays better. So angiogenesis is very sensitive to VEGF, um, so we've shown that the assay, you know, is sensitive. You can um, positively and negatively inhibit the assay with either VEGF, um, adding VEGF to minus VEGF media, or using an antibody against VEGF um, on the bottom to uh, inhibit vessel formation. This assay has been used um, quite a bit by uh, the NIH Screening Center. They've shown uh, dose response to many uh, FDA-approved drugs as well as other compounds. And on the bottom, you'll see that graph. That's three different lots of the um, angio-ready material being used in these assays. They've also taken these assays to 1536, and instead of a seven-day endpoint, they found it just as predictive as a three-day endpoint. And you can see from that lot-to-lot -lot variation that this is extremely reproducible and robust assay, which you wouldn't necessarily get with primary cells. They've shown this uh, to be very active over a wide variety of compounds. And on the right-hand side, you can see that not only are they measuring tube length or, tube, or area of the tubes, um, in the wells, but they're also looking at uh, cell viability as an endpoint. Next, I'm going to move on to some of our CRISPR um, isogenic cell lines. So this is uh, a very popular model uh, now uh, that uh, you can do uh, CRISPR gene editing. A lot of people are making um, isogenic cell lines. We decided to try to go that one step better in trying to use the best models that we can, again, that vast portfolio that we have. And this is just um, a summary of some of the lines that we have. Uh, for instance, for non-small cell lung cancer, about a third of the patients have a translocation. There were really no good models available for studying that particular mutation. So we made that uh, via, via CRISPR. There's also um, several gene mutation drivers. Um, IDH1 is a, is a driver for glioma, so we've made that mutation in a glioma cell line, as well as IDH2 is a driver in leukemia, so again, we used a leukemia cell line as the base for making that mutation. A particularly underserved area is um, drug resistance and especially in melanoma, which becomes drug resistant quite rapidly. So we use the A375 melanoma cell line, which is a great model for BRAF-induced melanoma, and we introduced three different um, drug-resistant mutations into that, one for NRAS, one for KRAS, and one for MEK. And I'll show you some of that data. But first, I mean, if academics or perhaps even within your own labs you're making isogenics, you have a specific purpose for that. So you make it and then you test it. If it works for what, for what you need it for, great, you move on. For us, we don't necessarily know exactly how our customers are going to be using that. So we do extensive QC so that we are sure that there are no off-target effects, that everything is working properly. So whatever application that you're using these for, there's a good chance that it's going to be working for you. So we do sequencing um, of the editing event. We check transcription, translation. This is some data um, from, the, uh, from the translocation, but we have this kind of data for all of our uh, edited cell lines. So we check transcription, translation, and we do extensive uh, analysis for off-target effects. An example of the type of data that you see, this is from the, the MEC1 melanoma model um, of drug resistance, and you can see that um, it shows increased resistance uh, to inhibitors, both BRAF-specific inhibitors as well as MEC-specific inhibitors. For most of the data that I'm going to be showing today, I'm going to be going through it quite quickly. If, any area is of particular interest to you, my R&D scientists love to come and visit customers. So if you'd like seminars within your own teams or within your own groups, we can certainly do that. 
Again, um, this is with the NRAS uh, melanoma model uh, showing with drug, with drug um, treatment on the right-hand side, you can see that you get activation of the genes that, that you would expect. And finally, these models can also be used in 3D. 3D phenotypic screening is, is quite popular these days. Um, I just think this makes gorgeous wall art. Uh, but um, you can see the, the wild types on the left, and you see very different morphology as well as um, reaction to the, to the various drugs that, that were used here. And so you can glean some additional information than you would in a regular 2D assay. I'm going to move on now to another sort of underserved model area, and that's in epithelial to mesenchymal transition. This is important in metastasis, so EMT models. There aren't very many of these out there. The first one that we've made is a lung model uh, for lung cancer. When cells undergo epithelial to mesenchymal transition, when they, in the epithelial state, they have a high E cadherin. Um, in the, the mesenchymal, it's high vimentin. So we've engineered a cell line that has an RFP in the vimentin so that you get, um, you get that reporter when it goes through that induction. So you can see here on, on the left-hand side, we have some uh, before, trans, before induction. You can see the typical um, morphology of epithelial that certainly moves to, to the um, mesenchymal morphology. You get, you have the high green, in this case is the antibody staining for, for E. cadherin versus the red that you see with vimentin, and you can see the, the data that you get very nice uh, differences w with the induction. You also have increased uh, invasive capacity. I'm not sure if you can see this very well, um, but you can see the graphs below. You can measure this either by live cell nuclear stain or um, with, the, with the RFP. Um, this is migrating through an eight micron pore. In addition, we've shown that known signal inhibitors, signaling inhibitors do block the, the transition. Uh, EMT is a very complex area. Uh, but there are known um, TGF-beta and SARC family inhibitors, and we've shown that those do um, block that, that EMT trans transition. I'm going to move now away from cancer, uh, diag uh, cancer de drug development to toxicology. This is a very important area, an area where people are looking to move to cell lines rather than animal models, especially in early um, in early testing. Again, we have a very broad portfolio that all have the hallmarks of that traceable, authenticated, and highly characterized cell lines. We have a number of different portfolios that are relevant in the tox area. Most of them include some primary cells as well as, as those HTERT immortalized primary cells. In this case, uh, the airway portfolio, most of these cells, uh, when in use, are, are cultured with an air-liquid interface, a ALI uh, type culture, and you can see here from those images that the cells do produce cilia, they produce mucin uh, producing uh, goblet cells, and can be used in various types of assays. Another uh, uh, portfolio that generally uses the ALI culture methods is the skin models. Here um, we form, you know, that multi-layered structure that, that you want to see, and typical assays are wound healing or irritation types of assays. For toxicology, we have iPS-derived neural progenitor cells. These can be fairly uh, routinely differentiated into neurons, oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, and they do show a uh, specific selective response to neurotoxic agents. I'm going to talk a little more detail about uh, some of our kidney models. In particular, these are very interesting because, again, an uh, underserved area, there aren't very good kidney models for renal toxicity out there. In addition, there's been some recent uh, draft regulatory guidance around the use of OCT1, 3, and OT2 
um, in select drug testing. And there are specifically lack of models in this because kidney cells, once they're put into culture, lose those transporters very rapidly. Those, that transport, which is shown on the right-hand side, occurs mostly in the, the renal proximal tubular area of the kidney. And uh, ATCC, because we have a, an HTERT immortalized renal proximal tubule cell, we had the unique opportunity to really create some great models here. So we took that RPTEC cell, that immortalized renal proximal tubule epithelial cell, and we added either the OAT1, OCT2, or OAT3, and we were able to develop stable cell lines that express each of these transporters. This is just uh, an example of the OAT1, but all of, all of the cell lines have similar data that shows that these uh, transporters are correctly localized to the cell membrane of those cells. You see the OAT1 uh, cell line on the top and the parental cell line on the bottom, which shows no OAT1 expression. All of these cell lines also maintain key renal markers of epithelial cells. Um, on the bottom is the parental, and you can see that each of those uh, cell lines shows a similar pattern for CD13 and EDCAT adherin. An important characteristic um, for transporter cells are domes. At high density, cells that have this transporter secretory um, characteristics will form domes in culture. And um, hopefully you can see here, it's pointed out by the green arrows, both the parental as well as all of these um, uh, uh, transporter cell lines do produce domes. We've done extensive characterization of these. This is just, exam again, uh, example data from the OAT1. We've shown that the that the genes are, are transcribed, that they're appropriately translated. We've done sequencing, and we've also looked at the number of copies that have been integrated into the genome. In the case of OAT1, that is uh, seven copies versus the two that you would ha normally have in a, in a kidney cell. Of course, the two in the, in the Arpitex are inactive, but you would have two in act normal active kidney cells. We've also shown that, that each of these displays high uptake of compounds, uh, for transporter compounds, and very nice uh, sensitivity here. And again, we've shown that inhibitors block that very specifically. We've also had uh, independent external confirmation of the um, OC2 model. This was done at Ohio State University uh, College of Pharmacy. College of Pharmacy, where they were, this is a, um, a radioactive assay where they were using radio labeled TEA on the left hand side or metformin on the right hand side, and they showed that you got good uptake um, and that that uptake was not uh, inhibited by a compound that, that should not inhibit this process, but was specifically inhibited by two compounds that should. So most of the data that I've shown you so far has been, um, except for that, the spheroids uh, for in the um, CRISPR models, isogenics, has been mostly 2D. Um, however, you as well as, as the R&D teams at ATCC are very interested in getting more predictive models. How can we deliver even more predictive models? And certainly there's been a wealth of information over the past several years about the use of 3D models and how those may be more predictive in certain cases. So that is an area that ATCC is actively pursuing. We're very pleased to be part of uh, the human uh, cancer Models Initiative. This is a consortium of seven groups that you can see uh, over there on the right-hand side. The goal of this program is to bring a large number of um, models, mostly uh, 3D, some 2D uh, organoids, as well as conditionally reprogrammed cells and other technologies, to bring a number of, of models, especially in rare cancers, pediatric cancers, other underserved areas. 
The difference here is that each of these models is going to have full sequence information as well as patient information and response to treatment. Obviously, that information will be anonymized. This is a huge departure from the material that we have today, which for the most part doesn't come with that kind of information. So we feel, feel that these are going to be extremely valuable and we anticipate the first of these models being available later this year. Uh, this is some examples of, of some colorectal uh, organoids that we've been working with. Uh, on the top left, you can see that those organoids in that, in growing in that matrix, um, the H&E stain shows that there is, you know, an epithelium surrounding that. These do produce mucin and other kinds of, of markers that you can see there on the right that um, shows that they do have relevant tissue markers. So in summary today, I hope that I have changed your mind and when you think of ATCC, you won't just think freezers. And, um, and that we have a variety of models that could be applied wherever you are, you know, in your uh, quest in, in translational research of bringing ideas into therapies. We also have uh, a wealth of, of custom services that go across uh, the breadth of our products as well. I'd just like to acknowledge my very talented you know, R&D staff as well as our external collaborators who've provided data for today. And I thank you very much for your attention and any questions.